Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Alex. I'm with The Scholar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're happy you're here, and we hope you enjoy today's program with Patty Callahan Henry and Amy Jo Burns. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out to our event partners for today's event, AAUW Harrisburg. Today's event would not have been possible without their support and enthusiasm. We're extremely honored here at the bookstore to have everyone from AAUW as friends of the bookstore. They've been sponsors of the Harrisburg Book Festival for the past five years, and we at the bookstore are extremely grateful for their partnership and support. Can we give it a hand for AAUW? Lastly, uh, this is our third Bookstores Love Libraries event. We're happy to partner with libraries across the state to welcome some of our favorite authors to the region. What it means for you um, at this event, show your library card at checkout for a free coffee or tea and 10% off any purchase for the, for the afternoon. Just make sure you show your library card at the beginning of the transaction and we'll get you set up with the discount. So a huge thank you to our local libraries for continuing to provide books and educational resources to our communities. But now I'm happy to introduce our authors for this afternoon. Our interviewer this afternoon is Amy Jo Burns. Amy Jo is the author of the memoir Cinderland and the novel Shiner, which was a Barnes & Noble Discover pick, NPR Best Book of the Year, a modern Mrs. Darcy book club selection, and told in a language as incandescent as smoldering coal, according to the New York Times. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review Daily, Tin House, Elle, Good Housekeeping, Plowshares, and Electric Literature, Literary Hub, and the anthology Not That Bad. Of course, our featured author this afternoon is Patty Callahan Henry. Patty is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of several novels, including Surviving Savannah and Becoming Mrs. Lewis. She is a recipient of the Christie Award, the Harper Lee Award for Alabama's Distinguished Writer of the Year Award, and the Alabama Library Association Book of the Year. She is the co host and co creator of the popular weekly online live web show and podcast, Friends and Fiction. A full-time author and mother of three, she lives in Alabama and South Carolina with her family. Of course, the book we are here for today is titled The Secret Book of Flora Lee. Sarah Penner writes at its quote, a spellbinding tale of hope and perseverance. The Secret Book of Flora Lee is as enchanting and whimsical as a Whisperwood fairy tale hidden within its pages. It reminds us that a happily ever after isn't out of reach so long as we heed the tiny voice within whispering that the real magic of the story may be closer than we think. We're so very honored to welcome Patty and Amy Jo to Harrisburg for the very first time. So without further ado, please join me giving a warm welcome to Patty Callahan and Amy Jo Burns. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for coming. We saw the chair set up and we were like, uh-oh, really? <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. Judy, I can't believe you're here. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Somebody just surprised me. So somebody I grew up with, she's not allowed to talk. Somebody that lived with my family, you know, nothing, you know what a bookworm I was. Well, thank you so much, everybody for coming out. I have been looking forward to doing this for months. I mean, we heard, you know, some of Patty's professional background, but I first met her met a few years ago on a panel over zoom during the pandemic. And so quickly, you know, uh, I fell in love with her and her work. My book club last summer read Becoming Mrs. Lewis. We all loved it. I bought that book for my sister, you know, for my mom. So getting to do this is, is just such a treat. Wait a minute. Is this our first time in person? Yes. I've never met you. That today was the day. We have been like, that is crazy. We, we really know each other well. That yes. is nice. And we and have I, similar backgrounds. We've been writing about the yes. same things. Yeah. And I That's think- crazy. I guess what I wanted to say that I so appreciate about you as a person and as a writer is that I feel like you don't have fans that are just fans of your books. You have fans for life. When they read one book of yours, they want to read the next, the next. And that goes for not only you as a writer, but you as a co-panelist over Zoom, you as an interviewer or a podcaster, you know, doing friends and fiction. And I think what really resonates with people is your presence. You are so present with people in a really loving way. And that extends also to the characters that you create, to the plots um, and, and the setting. And I think that keeps bringing people back. And that's one of many reasons why I'm so excited to share this so afternoon sweet. with all of you. So let us talk about- That was so nice. Yeah, Thank you. It's the truth. Did anybody tape that? <laughs> oh, it's, it's awesome. And awesome. so we are here though, to talk about 
uh, Patty's latest, which is the secret book of Flora Lee. And to just kick us off in case anyone here hasn't read it, they're picking it up for the first time today. Could you tell us what it's about and what it's about, yeah, you know, it's really what about. it's about? <laughs> um, all right. The secret book of Flora Lee contains some of my very favorite things. I wrote this book um, in, in secret in many ways. I didn't write it under what we as authors call under contract. I wrote it knowing I wanted to do something different with my career and with my publishing. And I included in it some of my very favorite things. So come with me. Here we go. The year is 1939. And we are in Bloomsbury, England, right outside of London. We're in Mecklenburg Square, which is a very storied place where Virginia Woolf lived and the Bloomsbury group lived. But we meet the Linden family, 15-year-old Hazel and five-year-old Flora Lee and their mom. It is September of 1939, and an edict has just come down from the government that all children must be sent away from the city to move to the country to be kept safe from the impending and expected German bombs. This was called Operation Pied Piper. In only four days, 800,000 children, four days, 800,000 children were sent away and exiled from their families and sent to strangers. They say it was one of the most complicated operations of the war to load that many children onto trains and buses and take them to live with complete strangers. They would board the trains with a knapsack carrying a list of expected items a ration card, so whatever stranger chose them could feed them, and also a gas mask. And if you look at pictures of Operation Pied Piper, you'll see the children running for the trains as if they're going to Disney World, holding hands, laughing, and their gas masks are just bouncing off their shoulders. And the little ones had Mickey Mouse gas masks. You'll never see Mickey Mouse the same again. It's terrifying. Well, Hazel and Flora Lee got lucky. And they got a wonderful family, the Aberdeen family, a mom named Bridie and a 15-year-old son named Harry in a small hamlet outside of Oxford in the Oxfordshire countryside called Binsey. In Binsey, it is a storied place where the River Thames runs right through it. And it is here that they have a really wonderful year, but they've been sent away from their family. And Hazel is now responsible for her little sister. So... She makes up a fairy tale world for Flora Lee. This fairy tale world is a secret between just the two of them. The fairy tale world is called Whisperwood and the River of Stars. In Whisperwood, Hazel and Flora Lee can be anything they choose a owl, a bird, a chipmunk, a talking tree, and they are always safe in Whisperwood. They tell it in the woodlands around the Oxfordshire countryside. They tell it in bed at night. They tell it in hollow trees. And it is a secret. A year goes by and the unthinkable happens. Flora Lee disappears. She's been playing by the river's bank and she is lost. And Hazel feels it is her fault. She believes that Flora Lee went to look for Whisperwood. The search is on, the townspeople, the police. But the blitz has started. And what is one more missing person? She is never found. It is now 20 years later, and Hazel is in London working at an antiquarian bookshop. Hello. And you guys have to go downstairs and see the antique books they have downstairs. It's just, I was like, oh, I just walked into my story. And Hazel is working in an antiquarian bookshop, and she is responsible for bringing in the packages and unwrapping them, looking at them, logging them. Is there damage? What year were they written? And putting them in the safe. She unwraps a package. It has brown parchment paper, a red ribbon. She unties it and she sees these beautiful original illustrations by Pauline Baines. And for those of you who are Narnia fans, she was the illustrator for all the Narnia books. And she slides the illustrations aside and she sees an American fairy tale book called Whisperwood and the River of Stars. That's my favorite sound. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. And can you tell us, um, how did this book begin for you? You know, at what moment was there, was there a seed, something you found that made you think, oh, oh this, is, this is something worth exploring? Um, we've talked about this mm -hmm. back and forth in our communications. And 
I find the idea of where do stories come from very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what Once Upon a Wardrobe is about. Like, where do stories come from? Um, Sometimes it's a lightning bolt. Like, you knew you wanted to write um, about moonshine and and a, a snake handling charismatic preacher. That's, that's, that's why it. I love her. Um, <laughs> that's what her book Shiner has in it. It's so good, y'all. It was my favorite book of the year that year. Um, and sometimes it's a lightning bolt and you grow on it. And sometimes it's mostly for me, it's just seeds, a little seed of this, a little seed of that. And I did a series on my Instagram about where this one came from. But the very first seed of this story I can find and I can pinpoint, and that is Operation Pied Piper. Mm. I was doing my research for Once Upon a Wardrobe. And as we know, if you know anything about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know, the children left the city to move to the country with the old professor. And that's where Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy came from, Operation Pied Piper. You never hear that name. You don't know that name. Um, But the minute I saw it when I was doing my research, I'm a research geek. Um, My greatest procrastination is research. Is that yours? No, <laughs> oh, <it's> my favorite. <laughs> I'm like, I have to read six books about this and then maybe I'll start writing. So my greatest, I, I, I saw that <laughs> Operation Pied Piper and I'm going to find out yours in a minute. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I got that tingle, you know, that thing on the back of your neck, down your, down your arms. And what that means is we're curious about something. And as a writer, you ignore that at your own creative peril. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait, because I'm a great lover of myth and legends. And I knew that Operation Pied Piper was not a great legend. And as we know, most legends and fairy tales have gruesome endings. They've been Disney-fied, but most of them have terrible endings or at least terrible middles. I mean, in Cinderella, the stepsister cuts off her foot to fit into the glass zipper. Mm-hmm. We don't see that on the Disney version. Right? <laughs> so I, I tell you, look, the originals are much different. And so I looked up that Operation Pied, I looked up Pied Piper. And I was right. The legend of the Pied Piper is gruesome. It is about a piper who comes to a German village. Ironic. This is World War II. And he is hired to get rid of the rats in a German village. He plays a flute, gets rid of the rats. He goes to the mayor, says, pay up. The mayor says, no, I think not. And the piper plays the flute again, simplifying the story. And he plays such a beautiful lyrical tune that the children all follow him out of the village. And the pi- you've seen the picture of the Pied Piper playing the flute. And the- y'all, they disappear forever and drown in the river Wyvern. That is the, what the heck? That is the, le- <laughs> what the- that is the legend that they use to keep children safe in England. And that was the original seed of the story. I, I wondered why they would name, uh, so I knew this story would be soaked in legend and fairy tale. Why would they use a legend with a horrific ending of drowned children? Right. And so don't tell anyone, but the original title of this book was The River Child, because oh. that, that was the working title the whole time, because I knew that, that the river was very metaphorical for mm-hmm. what happened to the children in the Pied Piper legend and also to the little sister, Florley. So that's where it started. And, and how do you know when an idea is actually going to be a book? Because I'm sure you know, you come across a lot of interesting things and, and do research on, on some possible ideas. What, what is it for you that makes you say, oh, this is it. This is a book. Oh, that's so complicated. Tell me, I would like to I know. know. I'm talking about because I, I want we to talk know. about this all the time because we've both had a similar idea that both our publishing houses said, nah, and we're like, but it's so good. <laughs> and it was very similar. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's a mystery. Yeah. The, the idea, what are ideas, right? There, I'm constantly fascinated by the seen versus the unseen, visible mm-hmm. versus the visible, right? And and ideas are not visible, right? They are not things we can hold in our hands. And so we could, for me, if if I get that tingle, if yeah. I'm really curious about something, mm-hmm. like I was about Joy Davidman, yes, I know there's a novel in there. Yes. But I've also been really curious about something and hit a wall. Yes. And had to stop. And I think I don't know, Amy, I think we just have to be willing to hit that wall Mm -hmm. because nothing is wasted. Don't you agree? I mean, I do. I think there's something about you need to be willing to jump in with both feet into something and it might not pay off in the way that you think it's going to, but it does pay off. It's just sometimes you have to take the scenic route. 
and and it's it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. You know, you get 20,000 yeah. words, 30,000 uh, words in. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the first time this year after Flora Lee, the book I started, I spent nine months on it and put it away. It just oh. didn't work. I wasn't the only one who didn't think so. My agent didn't. So, um, yeah. yeah, but I knew I already knew. So I was like, uh, I sent her like the first 50 pages wait, and she called and I was like, you don't even have to say it. Like, I, but what I did, yeah. and I think what we do is I took the most interesting part about it mm -hmm. and pulled it out mm. and started over. Ugh. So, but I, we don't always know when an idea is good. Like I thought I wanted to write um, a fiction novel about Florence Nightingale mm -hmm. and I did, but mm -hmm. it was a novella and it ended up being an audible original instead of a book. Ah. And I, it was just in, it was, I said what mm. I wanted to say in it because yep. I was a nurse and, and it wasn't a full. So I think, I don't know if we tell ourselves nothing is wasted, but I don't think anything's wasted. I totally Some agree. things are just yeah. more circuitous than others. Agreed. Agreed. But not every idea we start turns into something. And I, I, I feel like that's so important because it's so easy, you know, to see book after book come out by an author, whoever it is, as a reader, you think, oh my gosh, they just hit home run after home run. And that's not it. I feel like it's true in so many different areas and seasons of life that cr failure is, is a part of getting there. Oh, I love that you said that. And I also think that failure is informative. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we go all the way back to when we were trying to find an agent or a publisher, I always said, even when it was a hard pill to swallow, like rejection is a protection, hmm. right? Like that isn't the direction we were meant to go. And so I'm going to need you to text me that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me of that. Okay. Hashtag rejection, rejection is, protection. is protection. I appreciate that. Um, so you told us a little bit about your main character, or one of the main characters, I'll say, Hazel. Um, I would love to know, I have my own favorite thing about Hazel, and I would love to know what your favorite thing about Hazel is. Oh, wow. I love her so much. I mean, Me too. I've spent years with her. Hmm. She is the main narrator of the novel. We meet her in 1939 and 1940, then again in 1960, but we see the connective tissue between 1940 and 1960. So even though we're going back and forth, it's always her. We hear a little bit from the American author, Peggy, and then from someone else towards the end. But um, my favorite thing, well, first, let me tell you that I knew that Hazel was suffering, mm -hmm. right? I, I knew that about her. She had created a fairy tale world to protect her little sister. And then that fairy tale world tore her sister from her, or so she believes. And so that shuts her down from mm -hmm. the thing she loves the most, mm -hmm. which is her imagination. And I knew that she would be near the things she loved, but not allow herself to love them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put her in an antiquarian bookshop. So she works around books. She collects notebooks. She collects antique pens. She goes to coffee shops in London where she listens to other writers and scribbles, but never does anything. So she has shut herself off from the things she loves because she thinks her imagination hurt or took her sister mm -hmm. from her. And I think one of the most um, painful things as, as humans is unknowing, like yeah. the unknowing, having to live with unknowing. And I wanted her to be going through that. So I think my favorite thing about her is her imagination. Ugh. What is it for you? So, I mean, I will say, so Hazel is a big sister. She's got big sister energy. Yeah. I am a little sister and I love my big sister. So I would say, I just love that. And she has, she's got it bad for her in little space, sister in yeah. so many ways. And because of that, and because of the, the time period, the war and all of that, she had to grow up so fast. She didn't really get a childhood, didn't get a chance to be a kid. And, you know, at the beginning of the book, we see her make a questionable decision. Yeah. And I love that she makes this choice that makes you, you know, everyone's like, I don't know if I would have done that, Hazel. Not a good choice, honey. Yeah. But when you talk about she's constantly putting herself in these situations where she's with the things she loves, but she doesn't love them. There's something about making that questionable decision that just cracks her open. And I, I love that. I relate to that. And it just makes her such an exciting character to root for. I love that you noticed that because when I had her do that, I, I even the first time my agent read it, she's like, maybe we don't want her doing that. I said, <laughs> listen, here's the thing. 
when we're suffering yes and we finally see a life raft or a buoy or whatever like we grab onto mm-hmm. it right she was desperate and she immediately went what have i done but when we're desperate for answers in the unknowing we grab for whatever comes along yes yeah. and i think you know my favorite characters in books are the ones that love something beyond all reason even though it makes them do stupid things and that's that's it for her she loves her sister beyond reason and that's you know the impetus of the book and of her her life sort of beginning again so um just so exciting to read i love you notice the big sister i'm the oldest mm-hmm. of three mm-hmm. so i i don't know i like that yeah and I like, you know, I like being a, a little sister, but I appreciate the big sisters. I'm going to have world. to ask my little sister. She yeah. feels that way. <laughs> I'm going to say no, but maybe, I don't know. Another thing I really appreciate about your books is how ambitious they are in scope. And, um, and it's not just that the research is really fascinating and, and you said it in these really important time periods, but you're also able to weave a really compelling story from that. And I wonder if you can talk to us about the research for this book. Absolutely. I love talking about, we are going to open it up. That's why I keep looking at my clock because we could go for hours, but we are going to open it up for questions. So the research was one of my favorite parts of of this novel and of all my historical novels, because what I love doing is finding a little piece of history and pulling it out and flipping the story you think you know on its head. So Mrs. Lewis, like you think you know that love story? Sorry, you don't, Mm -hmm. you know, um, the background of Narnia, the what happened on that shipwreck in the 1800s, mm-hmm. like taking something. So when I pulled out Operation Pied Piper, when I was first starting writing this novel, it wasn't full lockdown, but we couldn't really go to England yet. Like mm-hmm. the borders weren't, it was, we could have, but it was really difficult. Um, our daughter, my husband's back here, Pat Henry. Thing. He came all the way from Alabama for today. Hey. Um, he said, if you're never coming home, I'm coming there. (laughs) I've been on the road for a while. Um, and the, um, the, the word, our daughter lives in Hawaii and even seeing her was insane. And so I, I knew that I could write most of this book because I chose places I already knew. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd already researched Mm -hmm. when I did becoming Mrs. Lewis. So London, Mecklenburg square, Bloomsbury, um, Hampton, he, Hampton Heath, Hampstead Heath, um, Oxfordshire countryside, Oxford, but I had not been to Binsey or Cornwall, hmm. which are the other two places you visit in this novel. Hmm. Just saying the name Cornwall is like, makes your heart beat, right? <laughs> I know. Um, so I finished the novel and then I arranged a research trip this past summer to go down there so that I could make sure I got things right. Mm-hmm. Um, I visited every place that you go in the book. I went, including an antiquarian bookshop, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But what's fascinating, I think, with imagination and as a writer, don't you sometimes make things up and then go to check and you're like, oh, that was weird. Yes. 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 And it's a it's a little nudge that you're headed in the right direction. So I'm going to tell you three crazy things that happened on this research trip. So the first is um, that I finally went to Binzi. So I hired a tour guide and she took me all through Oxford. You can walk to Binsey, this storied hamlet from Oxford. You can walk, you go through a small town called Jericho over the train tracks on a bridge and into Binsey. And it is the most charming thing you've ever seen. And when I imagined Binsey, I didn't realize its history. I chose it because it was in a countryside I'd been in and could describe fairly well until I set my feet in the town. But then I discovered that Binsey is this place that's soaked in story. It is where Lewis Carroll wrote much of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And there is a magic well in Binsey. It's in the novel. It's very important in the Mm -hmm. novel. That's Mm -hmm. where the Dormouse lived in um, Alice in Wonderland. They have a medieval church there. That's very important in the plot. That was the patron saint of Oxford, St. Bride's Wide. Her whole legend revolved around that. Um, That's a fun story to tell if we have time later. And then um, it's where C.S. Lewis and his Inklings would sit at the pub because it is a hamlet with one pub and one church, as all good hamlets must have, Um, the two most important things. And of course, there's a lot of poets that are from there, like Gerard Manley Hopkins. He wrote the Poplar poem um, about Binsey. 
So it already had a deep storied history and I was touring it with Tabby and we were walking down this long road toward the medieval church. And I was kind of thrumming with anticipation because I'd written about it, seen the pictures and I was finally gonna get to touch it and see it. And she was explaining the countryside around it. And she said, all those woodlands up and around. I said, yeah, that's where my little girls played. She said, that's called Wickford Hills, Woods, Wickford Woods. It's like, that sounds like Whisperwood, but okay. And we kept walking and she said, they've been in conservation. It can't be developed. When the family died, they left it to their daughter, Hazel. What? Wow. True story. <laughs> so on my website, I have a travel journal and I tell some of these stories and you can see all the pictures from Binzi. I climbed in the well. I tell the story about Hazel. Um, the other thing that happened um, was that I went to London and I went to research an antiquarian bookstore. Now, the bookstore in the book is called Hogan's Rare Books, and it is run by a man named Edwin, the father and his son, Tim. And Edwin and Tim have owned the bookstore for decades. They run it. Tim helps Hazel when she makes a nefarious decision. So I want I I signed up through a travel agency to interview an antiquarian bookseller. And she told me where to go. It's called Buyers and Buyers. And I walked in the front door and I held out my hand. I said, hi, I'm Patty. I'm here to talk to the owner. He said, hi, I'm the owner. My name is Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is so crazy. <laughs> and then um, one last story to tell you. Um, then I went to Cornwall where, um, and Pat joined me in Cornwall and we stayed down there and had the most magical time. It's it, it's a landscape that I've, I've never seen before mm. and will never forget and I'm dying to go back. And um, one afternoon we decided to go see these um, secret gardens. They're called the secret garden, the lost gardens of Heligon. And these lost gardens were locked up during World War I and all the gardeners and landscapers were sent to war. None of them made it and nobody unlocked the garden until about 40 years later. And mm -hmm. it is the largest garden restoration in England and it is stunning. But when you walk in, the first thing you see and you get your pamphlet, it says Flora's Green. Oh. I, like, I know. So I just, the, the research for the, so the, in other words, the research for this novel was in the front end, but also on the back end, there mm -hmm. was just all these confirmations, like keep going, keep going. And um, I infused how it felt, smelled, right. all of that. So if anybody's read the advanced reader copy, Mm -hmm. A lot of that isn't in there because I came back from England and uh, added a whole bunch to oh, it. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love hearing the story of how a book came to be. It just adds so much depth. Um, you've mentioned Whisperwood a few times. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what you see the importance of that? It's a place within a place almost. And um, a lot of your books are stories about place. So I'm wondering if you can talk about Whisperwood a little bit. I love Whisperwood. I think I'm going to write a children's book about it. Ooh. I've been thinking about that on tour because it's been so much to talk, fun to talk about. Just an imaginary world where you can be anything you want. And then yeah. in the end, you choose to be you. Mm -hmm. you know? But anyway, in Whisperwood, Whisperwood was so fun for me to write about. It is not a book inside a book. You don't have to read the book of Whisperwood and the River of Stars. You hear about it. You see them you know, go there in their imaginations. But Hazel gave me the freedom to do something I'd never done before, which is create a fantasy world, mm -hmm. right? Like I wouldn't do that normally in my writing. Um, I would talk about it, but I got to create it in this story. And I think Whisperwood came from my own imagination as a child. Mm -hmm. I was, a who here got in trouble for reading when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. Okay, my people are in the room. Yeah, yeah. get your nose out of that book, right? Yeah. So um, my people are here. So I would get in trouble for reading, like get your nose out of that book, join us here in the real world. My dad loved the word airhead. You're such an airhead. You've always got your nose in a book. I was like, yeah, because you're so much more interesting than whether Nancy found the clue in the clock, right? So I think stories were so, and we moved when I was 12. And so seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th grade, I went to four different schools. Oh, well, wow. my parents moved trying to decide where to put, my dad was a preacher, where to put the church, where to live. And libraries and bookstores were my sanctuaries. Stories were my sanctuaries. Mm. Um, mm. So psych psychiatrists say, um, I listen to a lot of psychiatry podcasts because I'm a pretend psychoanalyst. <laughs> and a lot of, there's all these studies that show that if you ask us what we want, mm -hmm. like, what do you really want? You'll say, 
you know, offhandedly, I want to be happy. Yeah. I want you to be happy. I want to be happy. But the research shows that what we really want is meaning Mm -hmm. and purpose. Mm -hmm. That that's what we mean when we say we want to be happy. We want meaning and purpose. And one of the biggest ways humankind has made meaning out of anything um, is story. It's how we make meaning of the meaningless, Mm -hmm. sense of the senseless. And that is what I did my whole childhood. And so I think I wanted to take that and pull it out and give it to Hazel and Flora Lee. Here they are exiled from their family, their town, their square, their gardens. How do they make sense of that with a fantasy world? And Mm -hmm. that's what I did. You know, I would run through the woods and think I was in Narnia, right? Right. I, um, I found the books that I could escape into and I wanted a door for them. And if you haven't read it yet, there's a shimmering door and they can open it. And I always felt like stories and, and books were like a door I could just push open. Right. And I wanted that for them. Yeah. You know, something I appreciated about Whisperwood too, is so often fairy tales that our first impression of them is they're about going out on an adventure, going somewhere. And this Whisperwood in particular feels so much about wanting to go home, that homesickness and just, Oh, I love that you noticed that. Yeah, Like it's a place and that's why they never shared it because Mm -hmm. it was their home. Right. If they couldn't go home, they could go to the one they created. And that is why I feel like the book just will resonate with anyone. Even, you know, we obviously didn't live during world war two, but that we can relate to. And I think too, when we say world war two, we imagine world war two novels of which there are a plethora right now. Um, and I wanted to approach this whole thing from a different angle. Yes. Number one, you don't see the battles or the spies or the war or Churchill's war rooms, all crazy, interesting, all places Pat and I have visited, but I wanted you to be in a chilled child's mind Mm -hmm. and heart as they are sent away. Um, it is widely agreed that it was a terrible idea, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. that they shouldn't have done it. Some children were killed because they were in the country and their city was fine. Um, Some children were lost. Some children were abused. Some children never wanted to go home Mm -hmm. because they lived in the slum parts of London and were now in the country. So it, it, I interviewed some evacue, an evacuee. I read a lot of first person accounts and I wanted that point of view to rise up and then see somebody from there as an adult and how in, in Britain and even in that generation, once it happened, you don't talk about it. It's done. It's over. Right. The evacuee I met when I interviewed her, she remembered everything. Oh, wow. And she told me about being sent off with her um, brother and how they were separated and how their mom finally said, forget it and came and got them. And they moved to Penzance, which was considered very safe and actually was, which is also in Corn- down by Cornwall. And um, I said, well, did you ever talk about it with your mother and your brother after you were reunited? Mm-hmm. But she obviously went. She said, never, not once. Oh my gosh. So I wanted to infuse Hazel with some of, so when we say World War II, we're, we're coming at it from a child's point of view as she grows into an adult instead of the, like I said, I like to take something out of the way you normally read about it or what you think you know about it. That's what I appreciated. One of many things I appreciate was it, it gave a new sense of, of honoring something that was lost. That was really beautiful. Um, I know you all have lots of questions, so I'm going to ask one more before we turn it over to you for Q&A, but you've published lots of incredible books. Um, Something I just want to know for myself is when you think back, you know, the night before you published your first book, which is Losing the Moon, what's one piece of advice or something you would tell yourself, your younger self then? Mm. So many things I would tell 2004, Patty. (laughs) So many things. Um, my first novel came out in 2000, May of 2004. I think the biggest thing I would have told her, well, two, I want to say one is that this, as we know, is a career for the long haul. Mm -hmm. This isn't about a sudden pop. Those Mm -hmm. are the rare and special, but this is about perseverance. Like I was like, why didn't everything happen right when I wanted it to happen? Right. And, um, someone once said, and I love it and I don't even remember who, that writing might not be a great way to make a living. Mm-hmm. God bless Pat. Mm-hmm. But it is a great way to make a life. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So I wish that. And also the other thing, and I talk about this in a talk I give about things I wish I'd known, about how anybody here done The Artist's Way, Julia Cameron? Big Hello. fan. Hello. Big Amen. Fan. Mm-hmm. Um, is uh, that I wish I would have 
combined, which I did a few years later, but I kept my creative life and my quote real life very separate. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell people I was writing. Uh, So when mm -hmm. my novel came out and told all my friends, they were like, you were writing Uh, because I treated it like I like I felt like I was saying I want to be an astronaut. Right. Right. So they were like, you sold a book and then their feelings were hurt because I didn't confide in them. Only my family knew. And Mm -hmm. I was writing from 430 to 630 in the morning and I wasn't talking about it. And and I think our life is a creative life Mm -hmm. and it's not separate. Right. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to transition to audience Q&A. But first, can we give a round of applause for Patty and Amy Jo? If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I will come around with the mic. Maggie has one. Yeah, I feel weird speaking into the mic. Um, so, you know, I love all of your books. And I was just wondering, I know you talked about how Whisperwood is a little bit Alice in Wonderland, a little imagination from your creation and Narnia, but reading Once Upon a Wardrobe, and hopefully I don't spoil, but C.S. Lewis and his brother kind of oh, creating I his world, I was going to say, is um, did that kind of tie into Whisperwood as well? So she's, she's asking about, um, so if you haven't read Once Upon a Wardrobe, um, it is about the seven events in C.S. Lewis's life that you, that I can see in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I am not a Narnia expert. I am not a Narnia scholar, but there are set, when I was researching Mrs. Lewis, I could see these events in his life that led to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And one of them is when he and his little brother were young. Warney, and they lived in a house in Dublin, Ireland. They would hide in the attic and make up their own world called Boxen, B-O-X-E-N. And in Boxen, there were anthropomorphic animals, meaning they dressed like humans, but they were like, it was a rabbit with a top hat, right? And I didn't want that, but yes, the idea that children can tolerate, because their mother died when they were 12, when he, when Lewis was 12 and that children can tolerate the meaningless with story was absolutely inspired by boxing. But here's how strange the subconscious is. I didn't think about that when I did it. I didn't think about it till someone asked me about it. And then I was like, well, of course it did. And same with their names. So um, I wanted to name both the children after things in nature. So Flora means flower and Lee is a river in England. They both have a a nature and a river. So Flora is Flora Lee for flower and the Lee River. And then Hazel is Hazel Mercy, but it's M-E-R-S-E-Y. And it is um, Hazel the tree. And then Mercy is a river in England. And someone told me the other day that in, I think it's German, Leah means meadow. So flower meadow. But then someone told me the other day, yeah, you know, Lewis's mother's name was Flora. I was like, of course I knew that, but I forgot that. So like our subconscious has, I mean, we only have our own compost pile to pull from, right? And so we, we think we're so original, but we, right? I mean, tell me one thing you have written that you were like, oh, can you think of anything? Like it's from your own compost pile and you look back and you see it and you're I like, I mean, oh. pretty much everything. Everything you wrote that's in, in Shiner. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, snake handling, all that is not, yeah, it, there, you can see the trail, right? Right. You so, can see the trail yes. for your own compost. Yes, trail. absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other questions? Don't be shy. Yes. So I have a kind of a different question for you. I just finished a book that had a character that was an author on a book tour. So in that case, it, do you know, uh, it's, um, the sea of tranquility. Okay. I haven't read it yet. And I love her writing. Yeah. And because I just finished it, I was thinking about you and I just wanted to know, like you go on these long book tours and it can't be all fun and games, obviously, but like, how do you keep yourself like excited? Like you're here now and you've been doing this what for weeks. Um, so what is it that keeps you fresh as you're doing the book tours? Oh, that's, I want you to answer that too. Um, I think, well, yours came out during the pandemic, didn't it? Or right before. <laughs> oh my gosh. What keeps yeah. me going during book tour? Um, that it'll end. Um, I'm like, today I'm on day 10 of 18 or 
10 of 19. But also, and I'm not being solicitous, I'm being true. Y'all, like I was alone with this story for years and now I get to talk about it. And I know what it feels like to be locked up for COVID where we were doing this on Zoom. And when I walk in and or up from downstairs and see all of you sitting here, if I don't have energy after that, I'm broken, right? Like that's it, I'm done. And so I think that I, um, the, I love the quote by Madeline Langle that a book is a bridge between the reader and the writer. And I can write that book, but it is quite literally only in my imagination or black and white type on the page until you read it. And then we talk about it. And then it comes alive because that is the bridge between us. And that book isn't alive at all until that happens. And so to be able to be on the road and talk to people, if I had ever complained about it before, I never will again. I mean, I whine when I'm tired, but I need my, to wash my hair, but I like there's, which I really do. But, um, but, but to be able to talk about something you've been alone with for two years is, and COVID brought that home in a really big way. And how many here are friends and fiction fans or fan members? Oh, y'all are awesome. Um, and that happened during COVID because everyone was desperate for their reading community. We didn't realize what we'd started. We just wanted to talk to each other and interview other authors. But the community now 155,000 strong grew around that because this is what we want. And so that's how I keep going. But that's a great question. Nobody's asked me that except in private. Are you okay? <laughs> Hi, um, I, as a C.S. Lewis fan, I mean, not just Narnia, but everything, um, you know, I, I, uh, I just wondered what drew you like to the becoming Mrs. Lewis, to the wardrobe, I mean, to Oxford in here, where did that all begin? So I've been, a, my dad, like I mentioned before, my dad is a preacher um, and I grew up outside Philadelphia in Narberth and Wynwood, Pennsylvania. Um, and I moved when I was 12, but my dad's offices were lined with CS. So were your, was that in your family? Did you? Yes. 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 Um, we have a similar background. We do. Minus the snakes. We were close though. I think we got awful close. We had tambourines, but not snakes. That's you were in the but, same room <laughs> and dancing like thingamajig. There's the banners, the banners. Okay. Yep. <laughs> This is another book and another subject, but um, our, our house was, long, I mean, he, he owned every C.S. Lewis book that he'd written. And when I was young, I mentioned I was a book, to, I would read the cereal box, right? So um, I would pick things off the shelf and I read the screw tape letters when I was much too young to read it, um, probably 11 or 12. I thought Satan was behind every bush. And then came this present darkness. Remember that book? That was creepy. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I read C.S. Lewis all my life. So what happened was I became, I had seen Shadowlands, which is the story of Joy Davidman, but told from his point of view. And she spends the whole book, the whole novel, I mean, the whole movie dying. She spends the whole movie dying or being a smart ass. And I just, I just felt like it was such an incomplete story. And I thought, I thought I just wanted to write that love story from a different point of view. Like I said, I like to flip things over. But once I started doing my research on her, I knew that it was much, much more than, no, nobody ever talked about. She was an award-winning poet. She'd won the Yale Younger Poets Award. She was McDowell Artist Colony legend and protege. She could read when she was three, play Chopin by ear, graduated from high school when she was 14, graduated from graduate school with a thesis on Lord Ori when she was 18. Like she was in amazing. She spoke six languages. She, anyway. So when I realized that there was this incredible woman that was just being turned into this dying New York Jewish woman, atheist, who may, who had Lewis write, um, you know, the book on grief, a grief observed. Um, and I realized how much bigger that was. I'm glad I was naive enough not to know about the Lewis community at the time. Now I'm very much a part of them and love them. And I think they love me. They act like it. But I would have been terrified to write that because a large majority of them didn't like her. And I would have been scared to write that. 
but I just felt compelled to give a different point of view. Um, and then her son read it and then it was all fine. So can you tell the story about, you know, you were writing the book and then they found some of her. Yes. So what was before the, it was in before. surviving okay. Savannah, they found, well, but in, um, right before I started writing the novel about six or eight years before I started, before I had the idea to write the novel, but they hadn't been published yet. Yes. Oh, okay. They found a box in an old stone cottage in Oxford. Her son was helping the woman he lived with as a child after she died, clean it out, clean out the house. And they found a box with 300 unpublished poems and short stories of Joy Davidman. And there were 54 love sonnets to C.S. Lewis that had never been seen or published. And so that was like, ding, ding, ding. And that guided the whole, there, a, a poem is at the front of each a line of poetry. And same with this book. I think um, when we talk about the origins of things, um, I love rivers. They're in a lot of my novels. I mentioned I love myths and legends. And I mean, rivers are in from the river Styx that goes through Hades to Moses on the river. Rivers are part of our archetypal psychology. And like I said, this was called The River Child. So the opening line of poetry in this is a Mary Oliver poem that says, said the river, imagine everything you can imagine and keep on going. And that's how I wanted that story to feel. So anything, anyone else? Any other questions? Yes. So if, if this is okay to ask, you mentioned at the beginning that you wrote this book, uh, the, secret, the book you're talking about today, um, in secret, and you were thinking about making a, a change in your career. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'll sum it up quickly for anyone who's bored of pub, pub talk. But um, I published almost all of my novels with Penguin Random House. I love them. They did Surviving Savannah, Bookshop at Water's End, The Favorite Daughter, all those, all the way back. Um, my two, quote, C.S. Lewis books, um, Becoming Mrs. Lewis and Once Upon a Wardrobe, were Thomas Nelson, um, which is what Harper Collins, um, and knew this book was different. And I knew that I would want a different team. It wasn't about not liking anyone or being, you know, mad. Well, sometimes, but it wasn't about any of that. It was about knowing that I was making a real shift in what I wanted to write. And, and I might have stayed with them. I gave them, they were in the mix, right? But I wanted, didn't want to pitch this novel and have input, I wanted to write this novel and then decide what to do with it. And so, and a lot of times I just pitch a novel and they say, yes, the one I'm working on. I pitched it in a couple lines. We're going back and forth about it because I signed a two book deal. But this one I wanted to see if there might be another team who understood it and me better. And there was. Mm -hmm. so. so this is Simon and Schuster Atria. And um, I've never had such a gorgeous package, mm -hmm. the cover and the book and the end papers. It's pretty astounding. Too big. Oh, I, you have them. Sorry. The publisher hired a, an artist to make these beautiful. It's Whisperwood. After. I have, I'll have them, but yeah. I meant to bring them on tour. And I also meant to bring um, the legend of the Pied Piper uh, legend in a, it's a fairy tale book with beautiful I illustrations. It's a horrifying story with really pretty illustrations. Whisperwood is not terrifying. So. You had a question. Did you know early on that you wanted to become a writer? Did I know early on I wanted to become a writer? Yes, but I wouldn't have been able to say that. So I've been writing stories since I could hold a crayon. I have some in my files at home. I think I wrote my first full novel when I was in third grade. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so bad. I read it and I was like, what is this, what? But I would write it, put on the cover sheet, color the cover, put my name, author, Patty, you know, but I grew up in the sixties and seventies and nobody said, you know, and it's not their fault. I have my own direction, but nobody said, you know, you always have your nose in a book. Maybe you want to be a writer. Nobody said that. And to me, um, writers were, 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 yes, I, yes, there's somebody, I, something I could never attain. And the books were the living things and the authors were just pictures on a flap, right? Um, I didn't know who wrote Nancy Drew or any, you know, of the, I knew who Judy Bloom was, but I, you know, I read everything she wrote. I had to sneak those, but there was nothing, 
which is why libraries and bookstores are so great. But there's nothing, nobody ever said that and I didn't think it, it seemed too lofty. Um, what they said to us in the 70s is, do you wanna be a teacher, a nurse or a secretary? And I really did wanna be a nurse. I loved being a nurse. I have a master's degree in pediatrics. Um, but after I had three kids and I was at home with them, I decided I wanted, I finally wanted to try it. And I signed up for classes at Emory where I was a nurse evening at Emory and just thought, I just wanna write one novel. I just wanna see if I can do the thing that has always sustained me. I just wanted to try. That was a long time ago. So, yeah, thanks for asking. Did you always want to be a writer? Always? Always, but had I didn't think it was an option. See, you don't yeah. think it's an option. Yeah. Why can't somebody say that's an option? I think I hope it's happening now because yeah. it took me a long time to tell myself to this, is, this is an option. Yeah. When did you decide <laughs> to try? Um, I had gotten a job after college um, and it was, you know, working in a corporate office and I was good at it and I hated it. And I thought, I, I just, I felt, okay, it, I don't, I don't want to look back. So I was probably about 23. I don't want to look back and feel like I missed my shot at, at the life that I want. And if I try it and it oh doesn't gosh, work out, chills. If, if I tried and it doesn't work out, I, at least I won't have, have said I never did it. And so I tried and I thought, okay, you know, I'll take a summer bang out a book. That'll be that, you know, it, it didn't, you know, as I said, it was the scenic route, but worth it. Oh, wow. I love that. You were much younger. I didn't try. I didn't do it until I was about 36. Mm -hmm. That's when I first started. My first book came out right before my 40th birthday. And I feel like that's important to know because there's all these awards and all this flashy stuff about, you know, young writers and who's, you know, who's the up and coming. The truth is books have to cook for a while. I was just talking to my agent about that yesterday. I mean, it, it takes a long time. Like you said, this is the long game. It's not an overnight thing. It's yeah. a long game. And, you know, the Pulitzers just came out, but they, they forgot. I know what happened, but, um, you know, you look at, you look at, you know, someone like Barbara King solver and you think, oh, it's so easy, but they struggle in the same ways and do the same things and had to sit down and say, I'll try. But I think that's what happened to me. I thought, well, if I don't at least try, yeah. I will forever regret it. I love that George Eliot quote. It's never too late to become who you were meant to be. Absolutely. I think I butchered that, but yeah. you get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Question to your left. When are you going to write a novel about Tolkien? Oh, oh. I, write a novel? <laughs> I would like to say never, but I also said I'd never write another book about Lewis, and I did. Um, oh, he's a complicated character, and a lot has been written about him. And I've read him, but not nearly to the depth and breadth that I had read. Um, Red Lewis. I think there's some really good work out there about him right now. There's a, not, a movie that came out that's kind of an arc of, of how he became a writer. And I love the backstory about how anyone became a writer. And, mm -hmm. and you know what I think is really in, the most interesting thing to me about Tolkien, and no spoiler, but a hint about what I have coming next, is that he made up a language. I am fascinated by people who make up an entire language for their work. Um, Beatrix Potter um, wrote her journals in coded language that she made up so no one could ever read her journals. And some guy decided he would decode them. It took him like 25 years and he did. I'm like, dude, she didn't want you to read them. Like, <laughs> that's why they're coded. Take the hint. <laughs> yeah, take the hint. She wrote them in secret code so you won't read them. But um, I, the idea of making up your own language to express you what you want to express is the, to me the most interesting he was in a beautiful artist and both some of his books and Lewis's books were illustrated by um, Pauline Baines, who is a fictional illustrator of Whisperwood. So, yeah, I just had to sneak that in for people who knew. So. We have time for maybe one more question from the audience. Anyone? I was ready to sign and chat and have coffee from the person. There. Well, first, I want to say before we stop, this store is amazing. This is my first time here. And if y'all haven't spent some time walking around, there's antique books and maps and lithographs. And this is, I could live in here and you might not find me. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Alex and You're Amy. Welcome. My she drove five hours round trip to do this with me. Happy to do it. Happy to. Do and it. if you haven't read Shiner, whoo, 
grab you one on the way out. We've got paperbacks of Shiner up at the front counter I'm as well. Eating. So, well, so come get Amy Jo if you want to get it signed. Yeah, yeah you will not okay. regret it. It's amazing. And thank all of you for taking your time and coming here in the middle of the day to talk about books. That is the best. That's why I do book tour. Mm -hmm. So thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. And thanks, thanks Pat, everybody. for flying in. <laughs>